Open, if you would, please, this morning to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to go through a fairly big chunk of Romans this morning uh, as we continue to talk about the resurrection. I am not going to go into a ton of detail on it. Um, last January, I, did a, I started a series on, on Romans, and we went through it in about 10 or 11 weeks. And so if you, if you have further questions, you're welcome to listen to that series. You're always welcome to talk to me, ask me questions as well. Uh, I love the dialogue. We talked two weeks ago about the, the importance of Jesus being raised from the dead, that if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then we are still guilty of our sins. We talked last week about the fact that we will be raised from the dead, we who have put faith in Christ. And this week we're talking about resurrected life, that the resurrection of, che- of Jesus didn't just, didn't just save us from hell, didn't just promise for us a resurrected life, but it also promised for us uh, the the a resurrected life now, to be able to glorify God now. Here's what we have on tap today. Our theology is this. The resurrection of Christ also empowers godly living. The resurrection of Christ also empowers godly living. Our application today is this. We have confidence in both a physical resurrection and a spiritual one. And our prayer today is this. God, use our lives for your glory through the power you have supplied. If you're wondering how do we talk about this with our kids at home, the family focus today is Jesus gives power to the Christian. In terms of the theology, the resurrection of Christ also empowers godly living. I I want to put it to you this way. There was a time in the first century that a lot of people questioned the resurrection. It was something that caused people great consternation as Paul would go and he would proclaim to them Christ crucified and Christ raised from the dead. And some would make fun of him for proclaiming the resurrection from the dead. For those of us who have been around church for a while, the idea that Jesus has been raised from the dead is not a difficult one for us. I've believed it for as long as I can remember anything. Like I, I have known who, known who Christ was and about Christ and his death and his resurrection. I grew up in church. I've been in church my entire life. The idea that Christ has been raised from the dead is usually not foreign to us. But what is foreign to us is that Christ's resurrection from the dead also provides power to our lives changes how we can live. Here's the question that I would like you to consider this morning at the beginning of this. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden back in Genesis 3, did his sin just bring about a physical death that we needed to be saved from, or did his sin also bring about a sickness of sin that we needed to be rescued from? Did the cross of Christ just deal with resurrection from the dead, or did the cross of Christ also deal with the problem of sin? See, a lot of Christians believe very easily that Christ was raised from the dead and that one day when we die, we too will be raised from the dead. But I find that most Christians, when you really talk to them about it, have a difficult time believing that Christ's resurrection from the dead also changed how we deal and relate to sin. That Christ's death overthrew the power of sin and death. That his resurrection gives us new life. See, when Adam died, look at this. This is uh, Romans 5, beginning in verse 15. It says the free gift, that's the gift of Christ, the free gift is not like the trespass. If many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by that grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. The free gift is not like the result of one man, Adam's sin. For the judgment following one sin brought condemnation, but the free gift following many sins brought justification. If because of one man's sin, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through Jesus Christ. Sin was, was introduced into the world through Adam and through, the, through sin, sin spread to everyone and death spread to everyone. And Christ has, yes, brought about forgiveness of sins, And Christ has brought about through his death and resurrection the promise of our resurrection one day. But Christ has also brought about victory over sin today. Sin, the number of people that I've met in 28 years of doing ministry, the number of people that I have met who when talking about their sin go, well, look, I'm only human. And I I look at them and I go, yes, but God is still only God. (laughs) Like he's still God. Like why, why do we make more of, of who we are than who God is? Why do we believe that somehow uh, what we do and what, we're, what we think and what we feel it bears more weight on this world than who God is and what he's done? Look at what he says. There's a lot to say today. I've run out of time in both the previous sermons, but you're the third group, so... <laughs> we should have packed lunch, yeah. That would have been a good idea. 
Okay, we'll do. Sorry. 520 says this. 520 says this. Now the law came to increase. The law there meaning the law of Moses, Exodus 20, given to the Jews. Now the law came to increase sin. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. If you're wondering how does the law increase sin, Paul explains that in chapter 7. He goes, I wouldn't have known what it was to covet if the law didn't say don't covet. I wouldn't have known what it was to steal. In other words, the way that we know we're doing something wrong is because somebody has introduced the law that said, hey, that's the wrong thing to do. Until you have the law, you don't know that it's the wrong thing to do. And so Paul says here, the law came to increase the sin, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace would reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a beautiful text where sin abounds, where sin increases, grace increases all the more. In other words, there is no sin in form, or there is no amount of sin in quantity that can surpass the greatness of the grace of God. The grace of God is bigger and more abundant than any sin, anything that you've failed at, anything that has wrecked your life. The grace of God is bigger than any sin and any amount of sin or any type of sin. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So then Paul asked this question in chapter 6. Remember, in our brains, when we're reading something like this, because there's a, a chapter break, we tend to kind of break our thought. Train yourself when you're reading the Bible to skip the chapter breaks. Train yourself to skip the, reading the headings and just read it as a letter, like Paul wrote it. So Paul has just said, where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. And then he asked this question in chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There were some people who had this mindset of, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. You've heard that before? There were some people who had that mindset with God. It's just better to ask forgiveness. If God's grace is so abundant, then I'll just sin tomorrow and he'll forgive me. And all of us at some point in our lives have probably been faced with a decision where we're like, I know this is not the right thing to do, but God is gracious, so he'll forgive me. And then we do it anyway. That's Paul's going, are you kidding? He goes, because the argument that was being made is, wait a minute, if every time I sin, I get to demonstrate how gracious God is, I have an idea, what if I just sin a lot? That's ludicrous, right? Somebody goes, man, show me God's grace. Okay, give me a week. Let me go do a whole bunch of sin. And then next week, I'll stand in front of you and say, God forgave me. Isn't he good? That's dumb, right? So Paul goes, look, where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Does that mean then we should just do whatever we want to do so that grace will cover it? No. Okay? No, absolutely not. And look at this thing that he says in, in chapter 2, or chapter 6, verse 2. By no means, how can we who died to sin live any longer in it? We have died to what? Sin. This is a, a group participation kind of day, Okay. Do you not know that all of us who have been, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too could walk in newness of life. Listen, when he says that we too could walk in newness of life, he's not just talking about one day that your body will be raised from the dead and enter into glory. He is talking about right now that your life can be walked in righteousness, can be walked differently because Christ has died and been raised from the dead and you have died with Christ and been raised from the dead. That, that is what has happened for those of us who have put faith in Christ. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, our old nature, the old man, whatever you want to call it, was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin would be brought to nothing. Some of your translations will say rendered inoperable or rendered powerless. So verse 6 again, we know that our old self was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin would be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So that we wouldn't be slaves to what? Sin. Okay? Verse 7, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. The one who has died has been set free from sin. Christian, if you have put faith in Jesus, we just sang about it, you have died with Christ and you have been raised with Christ. Man, we need to talk about that sometime because that's a really cool thing, but we don't have time to go into a lot of detail on that right now. But I do need you to see this. Listen to verse 2. 6-2 uh, again. How shall we who died to sin... 
live any longer in it. Verse 3, you have been baptized into Christ's death. Verse 4, you were buried with Christ into death. Verse 5, you have been united with him in his death. Verse 6, our old self has been crucified with him. Verse 7, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. Verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Christian, when you put your faith in Jesus, in that moment, spiritually, something changed in you, and you died with Christ, and you were raised to walk in newness of life. And sin used to, to rule over you, but it does so no more. Because you are no longer, it has been rendered powerless. You are no longer a slave to sin. In verse 7, the one who has died has been set free from sin. All the people who walk around wringing their hands going, man, I'm only human. I'm just going to continue to fail. I'm just going to continue to screw up. Either they're not actually believers or they don't understand the power of God at work in them. God has made us new, has changed us. This is not a hopeless cause. This isn't something that you just kind of, oh, man, too bad. All the, hold on, jump down to 620. Listen, I really want to go through all of this, but we just don't have time, so i got to keep moving. Uh, 620, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. This is a really funny sentence. It's hilarious, and I don't mean that tongue-in-cheek. It's really funny because he says, when you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. And the reason that that's funny is because, like, it basically means, look, when you were really wicked, you were free from all sorts of holiness and godliness. That's what it's saying. You didn't have any of that in you. When you, were, when you used to live outside of Christ, when you didn't know who Jesus was, when you were an enemy of God, when you were by nature a child of wrath, you were free from godliness. And he's using that language on purpose because now in Christ, he's already told us twice, you've been set free from what? Sin. When you were living that way, you were free from righteousness, but now that you're righteous, you're free from sin. Do you see? When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Verse 21. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. Being a slave to sin bears no fruit. It brings about condemnation and death. Verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin. Are we set free from sin? Yes. Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves from God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Listen, I, I forgot to tell you the application. We have confidence in a physical resurrection, but also a spiritual one. Meaning this, I know that one day when I die... I will close my eyes and I will open them in glory. I know that one day that Christ will return and the dead will be raised and they will enter into the presence of God. I know that. I know that we will receive a new body just like we talked about last week. But I also know that because of my faith in Jesus, something spiritually has changed in me right now. I'm a new person, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away and all things have become new. The old things have passed away. Now listen to this. So, when you were a slave to sin, you were free from righteousness, but are we slaves to sin now? No. When you were a slave to sin, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, so 6.6 6 says that you are no longer slaves to sin, 6.7 six, says that you've been set free from sin, 6.22 says that you have been set free from sin, so you were joined to sin and now you're joined to Jesus. Does everybody see the two pictures? Chapter 7. Please do not pull chapter 7 out of context. Please don't just make it stand on its own, okay? Or do you not know? So he's just said, when you were a slave to sin, you were free from righteousness, but now you're a slave to God, so you're free from sin. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, so Jews who are under the Jewish law or Gentiles who know the Jewish law, that the law is binding only uh, on a person only as long as he lives. In other words, the rules only matter when you're alive. Right? You can't break the speed limit when you're dead. Okay? You can't violate the rules when you're dead. Right? 
So the law is only binding on a person as long as he lives. Thus, a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. If her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is still alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another, she's not an adulteress. Let's explain this. Here's a woman. She marries a man. If she leaves him and goes and marries somebody else, she's an adulteress. But if her husband dies and she marries somebody else, she's not an adulteress. This is a super easy question. Why? Because he what? He's dead. That's why. She's free from that first commitment to the second commitment because there was a death that took place. Everybody good? Now, he's not really talking about marriage here because he's just said when you were a slave to sin... And now you're a slave to God. He's talking about two covenants. Okay? And this is what he says, verse 4, In the same way, my brothers, you have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you can be joined to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, so that we can bear fruit for God. Here's what he just said. People, humanity, used to be joined to sin and death. That's problematic for us. The wages of sin is death. Free gift of God is eternal life. If we're joined to sin and death, all we're going to get is what? Sin and death. That's it, right? So God, when we put our faith in Jesus, we died with Christ. Do we need to read those six verses again? You have died with Christ. You have been buried with Christ into his death. You have been joined with Christ in his death. You have died with Jesus like six times, it says it, in seven verses. Okay? And so we were made to die so that we're free from sin and death and we could be joined to... Starts with J, ends with Jesus. <laughs> so that we could be do- joined to Jesus, right? So he's saying this here. He's saying that we were made to die with Christ so that we could be set free from sin and be joined to Jesus, okay? All right, and then notice what he says here in uh, 7 4 at the very end in order that we would bear fruit for God. That should make you think of 622. Now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit that you have, we bear fruit for God when we're joined to to Christ, right? When you're joined to Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God works in you, and now your life is looking more and more like Christ, all right? Verse 5, while we were living in the flesh, that's before when you were married to sin and death, while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions were aroused by the law, and they we're at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from that law, having died to that which held us captive. What held you captive? The law and sin. Christians were held captive to the law and sin until, sorry, not Christians. Humanity was held captive to the law and sin. Enter Christ, and then you put your faith in Christ, and you're set free from sin and death, and now you're joined to Jesus. You were free from righteousness because you were joined to sin. But now that you're joined to righteousness, now that you're joined to Jesus, you're free from sin. That's a huge thing, guys. We walk around all the time going, man, I'm just, I'm going to fail. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to, look, Jesus, the living God of heaven, has not just forgiven your sins and not just promised you an inheritance one day in heaven. He has also given you new life so that your life can bring him glory and honor, okay? Let me show you something here. People always jump down to, uh, jump with me to 715. People always quote Paul here, and they make it sound like it's about the hopelessness of sin. Listen to this. Well, let's, let's back up to verse, uh, let's back up to verse 14. He says, we know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. You see that right there? I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me and said, man, look, I'm of the flesh. I'm sold into sin. That's all we can do. And then they read verse 15. I don't understand my own actions. I don't do what I want to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. You ever heard a Christian say something like that? I can't help it. I'm sold under sin. I'm a slave to sin. The Bible says so. Here's the problem with that. Let me show you the problem with that. Romans 6.6, 6, sin has been brought to nothing. You are no longer enslaved to sin. Romans 6, seven. you have been set free from sin. Romans 6.22, you have been set free from sin. Romans 7.4, you have died to the law through the body of Christ. 
uh, Romans 7, 6. Now you are released from the law, having died to that which held you captive. You have been set free from these things. So what does Paul mean here when he says, I'm in slavery to it? He's talking about the old self. In chapter 7, he's, he's saying, look, here's what it looks like to live under the law. Under the law is condemnation. Under the law is death. Under the law, you can't do anything right. Have you ever, as a Christian, tried so hard to follow the rules that you only ended up being frustrated with yourself that you hadn't followed all the rules? None of you? Just me then. So I've been a preacher for 28 years. I've been a Christian uh, for 44 years. More times than not, and by a long shot, I mean by a mile, more times than not, only until the last eight years has my, sh- my thinking on this shifted. But for, the, for most of my Christian life, I have lived my Christian life in guilt and shame. Because I'm going, look, I'm not measuring up to all the rules. I'm not in church enough. I was always in church, but... If you're, a, if you're a preacher, you're not there enough, right? When I was in college at Texas Tech, there were Christian ministries every night of the week. You could go to something every night of the week, and I did, because you got to be there, right? You got to read your Bible every day. You got to memorize the scripture. You got to be sure you're praying. You got to, like, pray before your Subway sandwich on Sunday nights, you know, or whatever it was. Like, I use that very specific example because the dorms at Texas Tech didn't serve dinner on Sunday nights, and Subway was across from my dorm, and I didn't have a car, so that's where I ate every Sunday night. And so you pray for that, and you're like, you'd go through all the rules, and you're just like, man, I'm just not measuring up. I can't do the things that I want to do. And you're very aware of all your failures, and you're very aware, and you think that you're a slave to sin, but you're not. Because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. That thing that you think you can't master, that thing that you think will always master you, that thing that you think is just going to crush you and you're like, man, my marriage hurts and I'm, I'm terrible at being married and I'm terrible at raising kids and I'm terrible at friendships and I'm failing in all these areas. All that stuff that you think destroys you has been dealt with by the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And not just so that you're forgiven. You are forgiven, Christian. Gloriously, you are forgiven. But you've also been empowered now, set free from the power of sin to live lives that glorify Jesus. So when Paul says here, I don't understand my actions, verse 15, I do not want to do the things I don't want to do, I'm doing, and I'm doing the very things that I hate. He is talking about what it looks like to live under the law. Here's how I can show you that. Listen. Verse 18, 718, he says, I know that nothing good dwells in me. That's in my flesh. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer me, but sin that lives in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Some of you will, you feel that. Man, I've tried to do right, and it's just like, Sin just attacks me again. Every time I'm trying to do right. It's funny because usually when people have a specific sin in mind and you ask them, how long has it been since you've done that? Almost every time, almost every time people have been able to answer me very specifically. How long has it been since you've done that sin that you're so ashamed of? Man, it's been a day. Man, it's been 18 hours. Man, it's been three weeks. Man, tomorrow will be a month. They can keep track of it. They're allowing it to master them. You've been set free from that power. I've I've started asking people, instead of focusing on how long it's... Look, can I just say this? Instead of trying to put distance between you and your your sin, try to understand who you are in Christ. And as you come to understand who you are in Christ, the result, back to chapter 6, verse 22, the fruit that you will then bear will be holiness. It's not the departure from sin that makes you holy. It's an affection for God and the work he's done in you. And that affection for God shifts you away from your sin. You want your marriage to be better? Don't try to make your marriage better. Love God more fully. You know what will happen? Your marriage will be better. You're struggling with your kids and the attitudes that they have, and you find yourself having an attitude with them. You're like, man, I just need to be better at parenting. Quit trying to be better at parenting. Quit counting the, how many days it's been since the last time you blew your top and start thinking about how to honor God, how to know that he loves you. And that he, anyway, side note, that's not, we don't have time. Listen, so 
Verse 21, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I delight in the law of God uh, in my inner being, but I see the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. You're no longer captive to sin. What's Paul talking about here? He's talking about what it looks like to live under the law. The law is not our friend, guys. It is an abusive husband, okay? And Christ allowed us to die with him so that we could be set free from the abusive husband of sin and death and the law and be joined to Christ who is full of grace and mercy. Verse 24, listen to what he says. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? People my whole life have been saying, this is, this is Paul as a Christian going, man, I'm a wretched sinner. Who will rescue me from this body of death? This is not Paul as a Christian. This is Paul talking about what it looks like to live under the law. Under the law, he couldn't accomplish what he wanted to. But listen to what is he, the question he poses and the answer he gives. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now listen to this. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talking about the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57 and 58, he says this. The power of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how we overcome death? Do you know why we believe so positively, so completely, that one day when we close our eyes in death, we will see God, we will be open to glory? You know why we believe that? Because the Spirit of God is written on our hearts, and because we are positive that as Christ was raised from the dead, so will we also be raised from the dead. To the same degree, with the same fierceness that you feel that, I want you to also believe that you have been set free from sin's power, because you have been. No more shrugging your shoulders. No more just going, I guess this is just who I am. No, you're not. If you have put faith in Jesus, you have been made new. You are a new creature. Your life has been given power by God Almighty. Now listen to this. We know this already. Romans 8.1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. In case you need to hear this again, all right, I'm going to recap. Romans 6.6, 6, the sin has been brought to nothing, so you're no longer enslaved to sin. Romans 6.7, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. Romans 6.22, you have been set free from sin. Romans 7.6, 6, you have been released from the law and you have died to that which held you captive, okay? Um, Romans 8.2, uh, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free from Christ Jesus or in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Have you been set free from sin and death? Yeah. Christian, you have been set free from sin and death. The two places in chapter 7 where he talks about being in captivity to sin and death, he's talking about what it looks like to be married to the old husband. What it looks like to be married to sin and law. Here's, here's a synopsis of Romans 6, 7, and 8. Romans 6 is what the cross does. Romans 7 is what it looks like trying to do it on your own. And Romans 8 is what it looks like to be done by the power of God in us. If you're trying to be a good Christian on your own, Romans 7 ends in hopelessness. And we go, oh, how can I ever get better? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Enter chapter 8. We have been set free from the power of sin and death, right? Now, I'm going to tell you this. I have preached for 28 years, and I'm going to tell you that for probably 20 of those, I preached this text wrong. And it breaks my heart that I taught it wrong because I didn't realize it, but I was crippling Christians. Pick up with me in Romans 8, 5. Man, there's a lot more to say about these texts. You'll have to go back and listen to the Romans series or you'll just have to, I eat. So, you know, come and eat lunch with me or something. And, you know, I, I happen to eat every day. And, uh, and we can talk about these things. Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh... For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostility or hatred to God, for it does not submit to God's law and it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Here's, that's the text. Here's how I used to teach it. This part's wrong. This part's wrong. What I used to say is, Christian, have you, been, have you been living according to the flesh this week? 
Christian, have you been living according to your sin this week? Because the Bible says if you're living according to the flesh, you can't please God. And I used to say to Christians, if you're living according to the flesh, you're not pleasing to God. A couple of problems with that. Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And our righteousness is not on the basis of our works. It's on the basis of our faith. Right? Here's the other problem with that. I'm stupid. Because the very next verse says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of God dwells in you. This isn't a matter of, well, I sinned today, so I'm in the flesh. No, no, no. Remember in chapter 6, you were a slave to sin, now you're a slave to God. Remember in chapter 7, you were married to sin, now you're married to God. Chapter 8, you were in the flesh, but now you are in the spirit. These are contrasting things that do not exist simultaneously in the heart of the believer. They are two different states of being. And if we don't read chapter 8 in light of Romans, oh, I forgot Romans 5. Adam who brought... Let's start over. Not all the way over. (laughs) Start with me back in chapter 5. Thank you for coming today. Really glad that you guys are here. Uh, In Romans chapter 5, Adam came and Adam... I'm going to mess this up. So in my head, there's a... uh, I don't know why. It's an old school chalkboard in my head. Uh, I know some of you have dry erase boards. In mine, it's, it's not that... I like, I like the dust and stuff. I don't know what it is. but And in my head, there's two of them, and they're as long as the room, and they're on like little pulleys, so you can pull this one down and write on it and then push it back up and write on this. And so you're welcome. Now you have some of that in your head. <laughs> so I want this to be in categories so that you can see it in your head. Any, any visual learners in here? Thank you. You guys, this next few minutes is just for us, okay? So here it is. On this side... We have Adam, and Adam introduced sin and death. Contrasted with that is Jesus, who brings about forgiveness and life. That's Romans 5. Romans, and I'm trying to do it to where it's facing you. (laughs) Romans 6, I'm not going to write it if that's okay. Can we just put it here in our imagination? Romans 6 You were a slave to sin. You are now a slave to God. Okay? Romans 7, you were married to an abusive spouse, the law, sin and death. You are now married to Christ Jesus. Romans 8, can I shift it up a little bit? Romans 8, you were a person of flesh. You are now a person of spirit. And there is a line between these two so that these two categories do not intermingle. This is who you were without Jesus. This is who you are in Jesus. Here you have no hope. None. For sin is your master and you can never do the things that will glorify God. And you are free from righteousness and cannot bear fruit for God. And on this side, you are forgiven and righteous and holy. And the spirit of the living God is alive inside you. And you are joined to Jesus. Christian, your sin is no longer master over you. So when it creeps up tomorrow, you shake it off. And you say, not, man, I've gone back to my old ways. You say, this is who I am. Righteous and forgiven and loved, and set free from sin. Today, this is who you are, having put faith in Jesus. We're not just waiting for the resurrection of the body. There has already been a resurrection of our spirit. Somebody told me last week, or two weeks ago, they were like, man, I came to your second sermon, and then I wanted to share your sermon with a friend of mine, so I went to play it for him, and it was the third sermon, and it sounded like a completely different sermon. I think all three of them have been different today. But see, my timer went off like eight minutes ago that I was supposed to stop, and and I didn't because, golly, I just, I've been itching to finish this the last two morning, the last two services, and so that's my fault for packing too much in. But guys, if you've put your faith in Jesus, 
you're free from that sin. You're not just free from its condemnation. You are free from its power. We've been made new. And so that brings us to our prayer today. God, use our lives for your glory through the power you've supplied. God, use our lives for your glory through the power you've supplied. Would you take just a moment to pray that where you're seated? God, we thank you for the promise of the resurrection. That this life isn't our final home. That one day we will stand in your presence in glory. That one day we will see you face to face. And that one day this lowly body will be transformed into the glory of a heavenly body. We thank you for that. That is truly good news. We thank you that we've been forgiven that our sins aren't counted against us anymore, having put faith in you, that is also truly good news. But I pray, God, that you would also help us to remember today that you have set us free from sin's power, that we are raised to walk in newness of life, that our lives can be different because they are filled with and empowered by your spirit that you have given us that we have been joined to Jesus in his death and his resurrection. And I ask God that you would let that take root in our hearts so that our lives would be used exclusively for your glory and your honor.